In 1928, on the campaign promise of continuing prosperity and a chicken in every pot, Herbert Hoover accepted the Republican Party's nomination to run for president. He declared that the United States of America was nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in its history. He predicted, we shall soon, with the help of God, be in sight of the day when poverty will be banished from this land. Yet shortly after his election, the United States economy crumbled, banks closed, millions of people became jobless, homeless, and hopeless. During the Great Depression. As the Roaring Twenties were drawing to an end, so too was an era of relative prosperity for many Americans. As early as 1926, the construction of new housing had decreased. Businesses had too much inventory and too few buyers. Nevertheless, an optimistic America wanted to believe that the good times would last forever, pointing to fortunes that were being made on the stock market. Even people with little money to spare wanted in on the action, and stockbrokers readily agreed to sell shares on margin, where they would lend citizens money to buy stock. These investors figured the stock's price was bound to go up and up, allowing them to pay back the stock's original price tenfold. The constantly rising price of stocks cast a spell over the nation. Noon hour traffic stood still as people eagerly awaited news of their improved finances. Even distinguished Yale University economist Irving Fisher made a bold speculation. The nation is marching along a permanently high plateau of prosperity. But the simple fact was that the price paid for many stocks was unduly out of proportion to the actual profitability of the companies who issued them, creating the illusion of increased value. On October 29th, 1929, reality finally caught up with the stock market, and what went up came crashing back down. Panicked investors sold 16 million shares in a single day, many for just pennies a share. Millions of other stocks went unsold entirely on that afternoon, known as Black Tuesday. In just a matter of hours, the stock prices took such a nosedive that any gains made over the previous year vanished. The market's collapse was the most distressing downturn in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. So distressing, in fact, a number of investors committed suicide rather than face financial ruin. Black Tuesday may have signaled the start of the Great Depression, but the collapse of the stock market wasn't the only cause of the nation's financial woes. The federal government of the 1920s had supported big business with low interest rates and very little governmental regulation, especially over the stock market. In turn, many businesses borrowed more money to expand than they could ever afford to repay. High tariffs that had kept American business owners happy because they kept foreign-made products out of the U.S. unfortunately meant many European countries were unable and increasingly unwilling to buy American-made products. For instance, Germany was barely able to pay the World War I reparations she owed, and high tariffs like the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act passed by Congress in 1930 only made matters worse. The tariff's goal was to protect American farmers and manufacturers, but it backfired. America found itself unable to sell her farm goods and manufactured products abroad. World trade, in turn, faltered as foreign countries imposed severe tariffs of their own in retaliation. Many key industries were struggling even before Black Tuesday. 
Throughout the boom times of the Roaring Twenties, agriculture had been in a tailspin. The textile, steel, automobile, and railroad industries were also beginning to feel the pinch. As the unemployment rate increased, most families bought even less. The gap between the handful of wealthy Americans and the rest of the population got even wider. Even though most Americans had not profited from the economic boom of the 1920s, they bought many exciting new products and services during this era of unrestricted credit, living well beyond their means. The banking industry, too, was hard hit. Some banks had invested heavily in the stock market and helplessly stood by as that money vaporized into thin air. As Americans began to realize the pitiful state of the troubled economy, many panicked and rushed to withdraw their savings from banks. Many banks simply couldn't instantly produce the cash demanded and instead shut their doors, leaving depositors with nothing. Bank failures wiped out nearly 9 million individual savings accounts. 659 banks were closed in 1929, and by 1933, one quarter of America's banks had failed. Millions of American workers lost their jobs. One out of every four workers was jobless. Only a handful of wealthy investors profited from the collapse of the stock market, like President John F. Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, or brilliant investor and presidential advisor, Bernard Baruch, who became legendary as the man who sold out before the crash. Performer and humorist Will Rogers probably put it best. 10 men in our country could buy the whole world, and 10 million can't buy enough to eat. So the millions of less fortunate Americans faced a grim and uncertain future. Soup kitchens and bread lines became as commonplace as the flappers and speakeasies of the Roaring Twenties. And Herbert Hoover's campaign promise of a chicken in every pot couldn't have been farther from the truth. America's towns and cities struggled in vain to help the thousands in need. The jobless became the homeless. Shanty towns, makeshift communities of shacks constructed from wooden crates, tar paper, and cardboard sprang up. Disillusioned citizens called them Hoovervilles after the president, and the newspapers they slipped under Hoover blankets. Others left the city to ride the rails, looking for work. Too poor to purchase train tickets, they hitched rides on freight cars, hoping they wouldn't be caught, hoping they'd find a job. Approximately two million men became hobos, wandering the countryside looking for work. Between 1929 and 1932, roughly 400,000 farms were foreclosed when farmers couldn't pay their mortgages and banks repossessed the property. Thousands of farm families became migrant workers, following crop harvests to eke out a living. Then, to make matters even worse, drought, coupled with the overproduction of crops in the Great Plains, turned the area from Texas to Oklahoma into a dust bowl. In 1934, strong winds blew tons of dust from the plains all the way to the East Coast. Dust even coated New York City and settled on ships 500 miles out to sea in the Atlantic Ocean. Unemployment and poverty hurt everyone, especially children. Many left school to work and help their families survive, and many more went hungry and malnourished. Diet-related illnesses like rickets and scoliosis became all too common. Once again, President Hoover tried to reassure the nation by saying, recovery is just around the corner, but it was not to be and more Americans grew disenchanted with his policies and administration. Secretary of the Treasury Andrew Mellon echoed the beliefs of most of Hoover's advisors that the economy would recover on its own. Hoover thought the government must take some action, but feared making government too strong 
and so he chose a conservative approach, calling together business, banking, and labor leaders and urging them to work together and avoid laying off workers or calling strikes. Then he authorized the expenditure of federal funds for large public works projects, like Boulder Dam, later renamed Hoover Dam, to create jobs and wages for thousands of workers. Hoover felt giving direct help to needy Americans would undermine their self-respect and look to private charities to help the hungry. Instead, he approved more than $2 billion in emergency financing to businesses, hoping their renewed success would trickle down to the people who needed assistance. It didn't. Rather, unemployment rose even higher, and Americans were caught in a web of despair. Americans, already tired of Hoover's pessimistic and cautious approach, then became outraged by his treatment of a group of World War I veterans in 1932. After the war, Congress issued veterans bonus certificates for their military service worth nearly $1,000 to be redeemed in 1945. Dismayed by the economic outlook of the time, the veterans demanded the immediate payment of their bonuses in full. In an attempt to satisfy their demand, Texas Congressman Wright Patman proposed a bill in which the government would immediately give veterans $500 in cash instead. To show their support of Patman's plan, between 10 and 20,000 veterans and their families peacefully marched to Washington, D.C. This so-called bonus army established a shanty town in sight of the Capitol building. Hoover provided food and supplies for them, but when Congress vetoed the bill on June 17th, he asked the bonus army to leave. Most left, but approximately 2,000 stayed behind, hoping to meet with Hoover. Fearing a riot, Hoover ordered General Douglas MacArthur and the 12th Infantry Force to remove the veterans. Shocked Americans saw troops use bayonets and tear gas to force the vets to leave. In the melee, more than 1,000 people were gassed, an eight-year-old boy blinded, and an 11-month-old baby was killed. The shantytown burned to the ground. Public support for Hoover foundered, and with a chance to change direction, Americans overwhelmingly embraced a new president in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, popularly known as FDR. Roosevelt won a landslide election to become the 32nd president. FDR, the two-term governor of New York, brought a feeling of energy and optimism to the Oval Office. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. FDR's campaign song, Happy Days Are Here Again, was symbolic of his positive, take-charge approach as president. And with a Democratic majority in both houses of Congress, he was able to make swift reforms that became known as the New Deal. In just his first 100 days in office, FDR proposed, and Congress approved, more than 15 new pieces of legislation aimed at providing relief for the needy, recovery for the faltering economy, and reform of the American financial system. Just one day after becoming president, FDR declared a bank holiday, closing all banks and preventing any further withdrawals of money by depositors who had lost faith in the banking system. Then, he persuaded Congress to pass the Emergency Banking Relief Act, authorizing the U.S. Treasury Department to inspect the country's banks and allow only those that were financially solvent to reopen. The act offered loans to those banks which needed assistance. And with the creation of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, which provided federal insurance for bank depositors, Americans began to cautiously trust the banks once more. The Federal Securities Act helped to restore public confidence in the stock market, as did the establishment of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which prevented the manipulation of stock prices. 
Perhaps the most confidence-inspiring action by the new president occurred only eight days after his inauguration. Roosevelt took to the airwaves as millions gathered around their radios for his first fireside chat. He explained in simple terms the steps he had taken to reform the American economy. Roosevelt's direct, personal approach to the American people was reassuring and helped him garner the support of Americans to enact several more policies in his push toward recovery. The Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, was formed to put young men to work. The CCC planted 200 million trees in the Great Plains to prevent future soil erosion and built roads, parks, and flood control systems. The pay was only $30 a month, but almost 3 million men got much needed employment. Meanwhile, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration provided $500 million in direct aid to the homeless, unemployed, and ill. The New Deal also created the PWA, the Public Works Administration, which provided funds to the states so that they could build schools, libraries, and other community buildings and create jobs for their citizens. When the PWA failed to diminish unemployment quickly enough, Roosevelt launched the CWA, the Civil Works Administration. The CWA created more than 4 million jobs, and workers built 40,000 schools and a half million miles of roads. In June of 1933, FDR's administration was able to pass the National Industrial Recovery Act, NIRA. It established a code of fair practices for various industries and set prices to ensure fair competition. The act also recommended minimum wages and maximum hours for workers. Meanwhile, the Tennessee Valley Authority was organized to build dams that provided electricity, flood control, and of course, many jobs for poor farmers in several southern states. That same year, Roosevelt also submitted the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which limited crop production in order to increase crop prices and help reduce surplus. Despite launching all these wide-sweeping new pieces of legislation, some critics felt the administration still hadn't gone far enough in helping the poor and reforming the economy. Some feared the New Deal was mostly benefiting already wealthy business owners and that it gave too much power to the government. Even ex-president Herbert Hoover was a vocal critic of FDR's New Deal policies. We have seen the creation of a most gigantic spending bureaucracy. That is not only a reduction of your standard of living, but of your freedom and your hopes. By 1935, the Supreme Court decided that the NIRA was unconstitutional, saying that its enforcement of federal employment codes went beyond the government's powers. The following year, it held that the Agricultural Adjustment Act was unconstitutional as well, because agricultural controls and regulations should be decided by individual states. Dismayed and fearing conservatives and the Supreme Court might unravel the New Deal, FDR proposed an intriguing bill to Congress. Roosevelt's so-called court reform bill would have added six more justices to the Supreme Court, justices he, as president, would nominate. It was obvious that FDR would choose those sympathetic to his New Deal policies. The proposal was promptly nicknamed the court packing bill. The bill failed and tarnished Roosevelt's image. Regardless, because of court resignations, the president was able to appoint seven new justices in the next four years who did support his policies. But FDR hadn't seen the last of his critics. Roman Catholic priest and radio broadcaster, Father Charles Coughlin, reached over 40 million listeners each week as he challenged the New Deal. Coughlin wanted a guaranteed annual income for Americans and a nationalization of banks. In time, however, his anti-Semitic comments cost him most of his supporters. Dr. Francis Townsend, another outspoken opponent to FDR's policies, claimed Roosevelt wasn't doing enough to help the elderly. Townsend won widespread support with his demand for a national pension plan. This money to be collected by the government and returned directly to the people from whom it was collected 
in the form of pensions every 30 days. Most vocal was Louisiana governor and then Senator Huey Long. Although a supporter of Roosevelt at first, later Long had nothing but criticism for him. The Kingfish, as Long was often called, intended to run for the presidency and championed a nationwide social program called Share Our Wealth. We've had the promises from the president many, many times. Now we're wanting a fulfillment. No empty words, no empty messages mean anything to us. And no kind of law except one that gives employment and homes and comfort and education to our people will satisfy us in the least. A great many Americans agreed with the Kingfish, and more than 27,000 Share the Wealth Clubs sprang up across the country. In 1935, at the height of his popularity, Long was assassinated. Despite his outspoken critics, FDR knew the economy had improved, but not as much as he'd hoped for. And so he launched, with the help of his humanitarian wife, Eleanor, the Second New Deal. Mrs. Roosevelt traveled the country from coast to coast, seeing the poverty and suffering, urging her husband to provide even more help to the needy. She became a kindly symbol of hope for the downtrodden, who regarded her as a personal friend. Thousands of children wrote to her, asking for help. FDR convinced Congress to pass more legislation to spur the economy, including a second Agricultural Adjustment Act, rewarding farmers that practice soil conservation and compensating farmers who cut production of soil-depleting crops like cotton and wheat. The Resettlement Administration loaned money to tenant farmers so they could buy their own land and established camps for migrant workers. The second New Deal's most ambitious program was the WPA, the Works Progress Administration. The WPA created more than 8 million jobs from 1935 to 1943 for a great many unskilled workers and professionals. The WPA constructed 850 airports, built or repaired 650,000 miles of America's roads, sewed more than 300 million articles of clothing for the needy, and erected 110,000 libraries, schools, and hospitals. Artists, authors, and musicians found work in the WPA too, painting murals on public buildings, writing, performing, and composing. A National Youth Administration was also created to provide aid and part-time employment for students in need. The Second New Deal also helped reform labor laws with the passage of the Wagner Act, which supported workers' rights to form unions, and the establishment of the National Labor Relations Board to prevent unfair labor practices. From 1933 to 1941, the number of union workers rose from 3 million to 8. Congress also passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, requiring minimum wages and maximum hours for workers. Despite the administration's pro-labor policies, strikes were prevalent and often led to violence. On Memorial Day 1937, 10 people lost their lives at the Republic Steel Strike in Chicago. Perhaps the most important legacy of the Second New Deal was the Social Security Act of 1935. For the first time, Americans over 65 years of age and their spouses had old age insurance. Jobless workers got unemployment compensation, and families with dependent children and the disabled received aid. In 1935, only about 30% of American farms had electricity. So Congress, with Roosevelt's urging, set up the Rural Electrification Administration. 10 years later, 45% of rural America had electric power. With widespread support from organized labor, minorities, and the public at large, FDR was re-elected as president in 1936. His victory marked the first time most African Americans voted for a Democratic Party candidate. With Eleanor Roosevelt's prompting, 
Roosevelt appointed the first female ambassador and several women federal judges. Frances Perkins became the first female Secretary of Labor. And Mary McLeod Bethune was appointed head of the Office of Minority Affairs in the National Youth Administration, becoming the first African-American woman to head a federal agency. Meanwhile, Mrs. Roosevelt defied the daughters of the American Revolution, publicly resigning her membership when the DAR refused to let Marian Anderson sing in Washington, D.C.'s Constitution Hall because of her color. Instead, Eleanor Roosevelt arranged for the concert to be held on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. In the midst of labor unrest, poverty, and hardship, Americans still managed to find fun at the movies. For just a quarter, they could forget their troubles in one of more than 15,000 picture palaces. Radio 2 entertained a weary America. Practically every home had a radio and families gathered to laugh at Burns and Allen and thrilled to the drama of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater on the Air. By 1939, the nation seemed to be on the road to economic recovery, and Congress cut back on the New Deal unemployment programs, since it had gone deeply into debt, providing jobs and aid to Americans. The economy started to improve, but the Republican Party blocked any further relief efforts. Meanwhile, FDR and America, despite wishing to remain neutral, began to realize that war was inevitable in Europe, and very soon it became a reality. Ironically, when America finally entered World War II, her massive investment in manufacturing guns, airplanes, tanks, and ships would finally lift the country out of the Great Depression. 